many strings to his bow, including racing mountain bikes across the Simpson Desert. You can have it. <laughs> uh, Alan moved to Longreach in Queensland 19 years ago and took up mapping and GIS work with the then Lake Air Basin uh, Coordinating Group. The popular Lake Air Basin and Great Artesian Basin poster maps are two of Alan's recent achievements and I've had the pleasure of working with Alan on one of those. Uh, for the past six years, Alan has turned his hand to filmmaking alongside ex-ABC journalist Bruce Honeywell. He's since produced over 280 internet films on natural resource management and in, in his own time, uh, until funding is secured, fingers crossed, Alan is working on an Outback documentary, which we welcome him to tell us a bit more now and perhaps even give us a sneak peek. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Michelle, and um, yes, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this country. Um, I think one of the things that uh, when I started researching the documentary is that um, I have a much deeper appreciation for, uh, for the traditional owners of the country, which we uh, call the Outback. Um, that was a, an appropriate introduction about the funding side of things. I've been, uh, I decided a while ago, perhaps full heartedly, that, um, that I would like to make an Outback documentary. I'd lived in this country, I uh, moved out here, I wasn't sure what had compelled me to stay, but probably like many of the people who work in this country or who've come out here from the cities or other places, um, there is something that really draws you to the place. And in some ways, I suppose it's a bit of a, a personal exploration, uh, the idea of uh, doing an Outback documentary. So my initial idea was something very naive. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe we'd make a blue chip documentary, uh, you know, which is a nature documentary, which shows uh, the wonder and grandeur of this, of this country. Um, and at the same time, sneaks under people's radar a little bit and gets them to think about some of the, some of the tough issues that are faced in managing this country. Um, having been involved in natural resource management, um, I was aware of the funding issues uh, and aware of the many, the many challenges that people face in managing such a sparse, sparsely populated part of the country. Um, so naively I embarked on this journey um, and, uh, and I wondered uh, how people understand the outback because I'd come from the city myself and uh, and when I when I was in the city, there was I guess there was that sense of adventure that was talked about in a previous talk. Um, you know that there's there's something about embarking on going into the unknown. Uh, but there was something else was drawing me about the open space, about the land, um, which uh, which is an ongoing thing which I wonder about. Uh, and uh, so. To find out a little bit more about that, uh, at the start of this year I went and did some interviews which you'll see in a minute when we see the short film that I make. Um, so I'm working on this on my own time at the moment and, uh, and I'm nudging it along, as, uh, as Fred Cheney put it. Uh, it's, a, it's a bold and ambitious idea and, as I said, probably foolhardy. Uh, but each time I think I'm going to fall on my face, I nudge it along a little bit further and just see how far I get. Um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that tripped me up was talking to experienced producers about what I was planning to do and the whole idea of a blue chip documentary rapidly uh, deflated like a popped balloon. Um, and I was left, uh, as we approached the conference, thinking, well, I'd said I'd come here and show a trailer. Uh, but no trailer was, uh, was, was materialising in my mind. Um, and in fact, having talked to those producers, I realised that all of the ideas that I had about producing a documentary would not work. They wouldn't find an audience. Um, and so weeks out, from, uh, from attending here. Uh, I decided I would have a chat with my wife or my partner and, uh, and say, well, maybe I could withdraw from the conference. Because uh, sometimes I think making, making stories, you, uh, you know, you set a task which could be too big for you. And, um, and, I was, and I was really feeling the heat. There's a lot of time goes into producing these things. I'd already put a massive amount of time into it. Um, 
Anyway, uh, I go back to a uh, Woody Allen quote, which I really like, which is that 80% of life is just turning up, so I'm here. <laughs> uh, not only that, I had a, a, you know, a, a very solid effort to produce a film of sorts, which gives you a window into what I've achieved so far. <laughs> the outback. I, I don't really know that much about the outback of Australia because I'm from Tassie. I know a fair bit about Tassie but I, there's heaps of things I'd love to go and explore like Ayers Rock, um, Kakadu. I know the generalisation about the outback that it has a sort of a connotation of somewhere that's ancient, remote, separate in Australia from European Australians' perception of uh, where they live. So to me, when I hear of Outback, I think of Australians, Aboriginal people, and beers and pubs, and a laid-back life of a lot of flies, and a lot of hats of corkscrews hanging down. That's the first thing I think of. Flies, dusty, <laughs> desert, uh, like some cowboy hats, long sleeve checkered shirts. I'm a nurse and I've got friends who've worked up in the outback and there's a lot of lot of health issues, there's a lot of cultural issues where people aren't necessarily being able to live true to their culture and cross-cultural issues. To me, the outback is uh, where the knowledge comes from that I'm sharing here, and uh, it's what keeps me sane. Let's put it this way, if I spent uh, all of my days here in the city, I'd get sensory overload, I'd pretty much go silly. Well, I watched a film once called Wolf Creek, which kind of put me off it. Because <laughs> now I just have this image of this man, uh, he's still out there to this day. This murderer man. <laughs> As an Australian, I understand it's like a large part of our identity, but my understanding of it's pretty, yeah, as I said, just what we get from TV shows and things, yeah. Come five rugged boys and one gorgeous outback mum from our most remote farms ever. We're on a million acres, supermarkets, 250 k's away. Yeah, so we're pretty remote. It's patience. Are those tough enough to call this harsh place home? I've got a broken leg. I've got horses booked in to come over the next few weeks. I wish to present you with a proposition. Suppose I gave you a horse and blood to go for second place. <laughs> and broken bones, all for crocodile conservation. Break your finger. Probably the man that had more influence on this Birdsville track than anybody else was a chap by the name of Harry Ding from Yunta, the Dings at Yunta. And he employed a driver by the name of Tom Cruise who became a legend on this Birdsville track.
In my mind, the most pressing issue for the outback is expectations about what the outback can deliver and what it is that are probably not based on reality, but are more based on some sort of wishful idea where people talk about uh, feeding the world and, you know, we need to develop more country, which obviously is the outback because, because we've developed everywhere else. The general portrayal of the bush in the media rarely gets beyond bushfire, drought, um, suicide, people in trouble, life's grim, and that will flip at times into whinging farmers or you know, environmental degradation. There's negative portrayal of the bush when it hits a news agenda. The current political system fails to deliver the ability of local and bush communities to have a very great say about what happens in the future. I believe the biggest threat to the outback is that most of Australia doesn't think about its problems. And because of that lack of knowledge, and at times that ignorance, we're getting ideas such as we should stop supporting remote Indigenous communities across the board. So my job was mid to late 70s working in that refugee situation with people in, in, on the fringes of town trying to establish the kind of support base uh, required to manage the, the transformative kind of period when people were pushed off their traditional country. Old people I worked with said, this can't continue to happen. We have to get back to our, to, to our country. We have to get away from a growth. We have to save our children. We have to make sure that we don't lose our language. We don't lose our connection we have customary obligation to fulfill looking after our country so we have to move back one of the worst things we can do i believe in the management of a functional landscape is to take people out of it because this landscape has co-evolved with people for all that time so if you take one essential ingredient out of that then things are going to change and they're going to change in a way that we may not like You'll probably have um, the introduction of a whole lot of weeds which would otherwise be controlled that are going to change basically the uh, ecological balance of the landscape. We have feral animals coming in that will change the ecological nature of the landscape. We may, with climate change especially, have more wildfires, more frequent fires, fires at the hotter time of the year that are also going to damage the landscape. Kelsey Nielsen, a grazier from North Abulia, once said to me, and it's really stuck in my head, Barry, you need to support people who want to live here. And not everyone wants to live in remote Australia. It's, it's often tough with the climate. It's often, it is tough with the isolation. So we need to support people who want to live there. And who are they? Graziers, uh, Aboriginal people, a whole range of individuals that are prepared to do those hard yards. The outback as a whole, the, the centre of the west and the north, is one of the, the few great natural places remaining on the planet. And I think as Australians we can overlook that until we, perhaps we travel overseas to Asia or Europe or Africa or anywhere and just see, of course, that most places are crowded, very crowded, not only in the cities but also in the countryside. Uh, and the outback is one of, as I said, you know, the, the very few places left we've got perhaps the northern Canadian forest, the boreal forests, uh, Sahara Desert, uh, the Amazon, and the outback. It's a very, very old landscape. It has some um, unique species in it that are not found in any other part of the world. It's an area of landscape that has co-evolved with people for maybe 50,000 years. It also represents the, the a lot of... Um, value to the ethos of Australians and the sense of who we are. This this laconic archetype, this strong, capable, independent, etc. They are exactly the sorts of characteristics that that truly do exist. But but as a, as a default self perception, the Australian myth is founded on a combination of bush and Anzac. Despite the fact that Australia has always been a densely urbanised country, well, part of what's changing is that. There are more people in Australia and fewer of them have country cousins or have spent time in the bush. And so the understanding tends to veer even more towards myth than reality. Um, and I think that there is a, a perception 
that there is perhaps a lack of sophistication in the bush, which is just not true, again, because, you know, you look at something like information technology, for example, and people utilising, um, you know, solar panels with remote area monitoring software with, with, with drones to, to look at, you know, to make sure the troughs are full, for example. The sorts of people that do that kind of work, you know, I find them among the most admirable people I, I've ever come across anywhere in the world. You know, you have this strength of character, you have a practicality and adaptability, a willingness to, to share and help that I think underpins the networks of communities that exist in, uh, in the outback. I find it remarkable and inspiring. You know, we find amazing people all over the place and it comes back to those those notions of, of these uh, intelligent people, hard-working people, people who are adaptable, um, who are self-sufficient, but also who have very, very, very strong sense of of community and obligation to uh, their, the, the people with whom they're living and working. And you think about the impact of Aboriginality on Australia. You know, we've had something like five or six generations since 1788, since since the Whitefellas turned up. You're talking about two and a half thousand generations of Aboriginal Australia prior to that. You think of the, the wonder of this continuous connection to country that has engendered a knowledge and a way of being and a, a system of belief that is truly ancient and obviously worked. For two and a half thousand generations, it worked. I was very privileged to work under um, some of the most senior leaders, some of the most senior cultural figures and the most dignified people you could ever meet, whose knowledge of the bush and the environment is intimately entwined in them and indistinguishable in terms of who they are as, as people as, and as individuals. It's hard, to, it's hard to explain that to anybody if you haven't actually seen it or, been, or witnessed or been part of it yourself. So that's a, a little window into uh, into just some of what I found in research uh, over the last over the last year, um, and in coming to the conference, uh, I guess I set myself this as a goal because it would uh, it would give me a point of focus to to uh, you know to bring things to a point, um, and as I've explained, in a sense, it all unravelled before I got here. Uh, through talking to producers and finding out more about the filmmaking process, which is probably a good thing because, um, you know, great works don't come from the things that we know, as we saw with the Einstein quote. Uh, but being in the place of unknowing that I am currently, uh, I'll see where we can go from here. <laughs>